Hey, Salty Church Online. No matter what time it is or where you are at or what day it is, we are so glad that you've decided to worship in community with us. Let's start by singing together. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us at Salty Church. If you're new here, we wanna especially welcome you, invite you to stand and sing with us today. Here we go. darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond 
All creation awaits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our the silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens cry let the earth respond all creation shouts with a voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God we will not be moved when the earth gives way Jesus, we're thankful that you've overcome everything and that we have victory in your name today. Come on, let's sing. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life. You're the king of my life. And you reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Cross the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. We're thankful, Lord. And then on the lips of the beginning, hear an anthem arise. Cause Jesus, you're Jesus, you reign above it all. 
Once again, welcome Salty Church Online. We are so glad you're here. Every week, we direct your attention to fill out a connection card at salty.org. This is our primary tool to get you connected and a great way for you to mark next steps. Perhaps your next step is getting connected to a group. We believe we are better together and we grow best in and through relationships. Groups come in a variety of shapes and sizes, but they all have this in common. They are all about growing in faith and in life through relational connection. Group Connect is coming up August 29th. This is a great time and place for you to get connected to one of our groups. Go to salty.org, click next steps, and then groups. A significant way we as a church serve our community is through Salty Family Services. Salty Family Services exists to rescue serve and empower families to prevent child abuse and neglect. We work to keep families empowered and together. Salty Family Services is fueled by the generosity of you at Salty. 
and by a yearly fundraiser happening this year, September 10th. We would love for you to join us as we celebrate the stories of these empowered families. Check out this short video. My name is Amber Folker. I'm Jennifer King. This is Jimmy King. My name is Christine. My name is Jen Samar. I ended up back in Daytona and found myself without a place to live. The uh, father of my children got on drugs. I um, just was stuck, didn't know what to do, where to go. We were homeless. We didn't have anywhere to go. We lived in a hotel. Tickets are on sale now for $75. Go to salty.org, click the banner at the top to get your tickets today. Every week we continue worship by connecting with God and connecting with others. This is a great time to spend praying or submitting a prayer request at salty.org. You can spend this time reflecting and remembering what Christ has done by taking communion, or you can give at salty.org. Giving changes us and it grows our faith when we trust God and join him in that mission to rescue and empower disciples for Jesus. Let's take a few minutes now to connect and we'll be back shortly for the message. Let's connect. Hey everybody, welcome to Salty Church. Yeah, glad that you are here, uh, wherever you are, because there's folks watching online, at home, and all around the place, and all of you here in Ormond. My name is Robbie, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to have you. Uh, I want to especially welcome all of the folks that are with us in New Smyrna Beach, or Flagler Beach, on our other campuses. And uh, as I was going to welcome you, I had this thought. For everybody in New Smyrna and Flagler, uh, you should ask your campus pastor, Austin and Jacob, how many quotes they have from the movie Shrek. It's just an impromptu thing. They'll be thoroughly unprepared, but those guys are really good at that kind of thing. So, And it kind of fits where I want to go today anyway, so I think it'll be kind of fun, right? 
Yeah, so uh, here we are on our fourth installment of our series, and we are using our salty values as an outline for the whole series. We are in week four, and so over the last several weeks, obviously, we've been hitting each of these, how we as a people serve and rescue and generosity changes everything. Each of those are some of those values. This isn't about a, a, an academic process as much as it is as in an invitation for you to join us in mission, for you to, to, uh, to grow uh, as a disciple. And because uh, we believe this is uh, a really good roadmap for that. And so every week we hit in any one of these. And this week is uh, the mission over me. And so that's going to take a little bit of an explanation maybe. Uh, and I want to spend some time doing that. But as you think about, um, in fact, as I get started, I might ask a question maybe to get you thinking here. Let's do the mission over me. Have you ever been on an assignment or um, an adventure or a trip uh, where you've got to get somewhere and accomplish some things? And it just seemed like at every step, everything went wrong the whole time. You've, you can probably, or maybe not every single step, but you know that just things aren't working and it just really can be filled with frustration. And you've had some of those moments, right? Think about a time maybe you've been involved in some of that. Let me tell you one of mine. Um, <clears throat> since I get to talk, I can tell you one of mine. Um, so uh, several years ago, uh, we, we had started working with Christian Surfers International a long time ago. And we were looking at helping to get some chapters started around the world. And we had an opportunity to go to Guatemala. Really uh, epic adventure to a certain extent, but little did we know what was in store for us. And uh, three of us were going to go, uh, had to drive to Fort Lauderdale to um, catch a Spirit Airline flight to Guatemala from Fort Lauderdale. That's enough. What could go wrong there, right? Yeah. The good news is we were supposed to meet Cal and Coral Fisher in Guatemala, but uh, it would go down there and I realized all of a sudden, like halfway there, that we're running late. So it's that moment of like, oh no, you know, you don't want to miss your flight. So we get down there, park the car, get in, we get to the, to the, the, the airline ticket place and we're getting ready to, you know, we got to get our tickets. But then, it, you know, our, our flight's like at 10 o'clock. So it's like 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock and nobody's getting in out any tickets. So finally at 10 o'clock, somebody like peeks around a corner. We're like, hey, there's a bunch of us sitting in line. They're like, oh yeah, sorry, your flight got canceled. And... And that, he was like, what? Like, oh, yeah, we, they canceled the flight. And, you know, it's like, so it's, it kind of starts that way, right? So we're just, everybody's kind of, you know how it is, just tension in the airport and all that kind of stuff. And what are we going to do? How are we going to get to where we got to go? And somehow or another, I don't remember how, but we uh, talked them into rebooking us a ticket on a different airline. The problem is nobody was going to Guatemala that day. And we kind of really needed to get there because we're supposed to meet people and all that stuff. We got this plan. Uh, so somehow or another, we got it worked out that they, we got a ticket to El Salvador, <laughs> which, as you know, is an entirely different country. Um, but it was okay because we had a plan. Uh, we knew where we could go and maybe find a place. And then our friend Cal and Coral, they were in Guatemala. We, were, we somehow got a hold of them and said, hey, we missed our flight. Can you drive to El Salvador and come get us? So we went to El Salvador. Uh, the good news is it's a great place to stay and hang out, which was nice. We spent the night. Next day, sure enough, they come over and they, they drove like, I don't even know how many hours to come get us across the border and all that stuff. Then we get in the car and we get draw across the border into El Salvador, I mean, into Guatemala. Then we got to find a place to stay, right? And they were like, we had this planned out and they, they had this place for us to stay. We pull up in this parking lot and I realized the hotel that they had got for us, it didn't even have a roof on it. It was walls. No windows, no, I mean, it, it, it might have been like a hunting camp kind of a place. Not what we were expecting. All weeds this tall in it. It was just not a hotel, period. So we're like, we need to find a little better place. And I was like, you know, Frank Coral, she might want something a little better. And it was like, that might, you know, I needed something a little better than just camping, right? So anyway, so we went and go find another hotel. Sure enough, we found another hotel. And as we're pulling up, they're setting up these speakers that are four by four foot, like 10 of them. And we're like, what's all that for? Oh, there's going to be a party tonight. We're like, are you serious? <laughs> you know, we're, we're talking like one of these late night, all night, I mean, giant speakers. We're like, we got to go. So it's just like one thing after another, right? So finally, the guy's like, hey, I heard about a place. If you go this way, go to the end of the road, there's a boat ramp. The boat will come up. You can put your stuff in a boat, and they'll take you to a hotel. I'm like, we're going to get killed. <laughs> we're going to get robbed, murdered in Guatemala because... I've never been there. I had no idea where I was at. And I get on a boat. 
Sure enough, we get there, and it's just like this 60-foot-long thing, and we jump on, throw our stuff on it, go through these mangroves. It's creepy. It's weird. And then all of a sudden, after about like a mile or two, sure enough, there's an island with a hotel. I'm like, that's crazy, right? You know, and, and, and it's just like, but if you've ever done one of those trips or you had something like that, it's like one thing after another when it just doesn't go the way it's supposed to go. What do you do? You know, even, even in life, you know, I was thinking about this way, and here's where I really want to spend a little bit of time today is, you know, who is really responsible for the outcome of your daily efforts? You know, Spirit Airlines, that's one. Uh, it's not on the list. You've got to get options, right? And as you think about how life can get funky sometimes, you know, it's easy to blame other people and blame God. You know, you can take responsibility for your actions for sure, or how much, you know, can you really trust God? And when things are falling apart, a lot of times we're not thinking, okay, God, what do you want now? You know, we're just like travel fatigue and nothing's working and all, you know, so what's your, you know, on a long travel day when everything's falling apart, typically what's your attitude, right? You know, so, and you got, you, you know, as you think through how, how do you normally function in that? And you got to be careful because you just don't know when things aren't going well, what the outcome's going to be. As it turns out, we walk up to go check into this hotel on this island in the middle of somewhere thinking we're going to get killed. We go to check in and we walk up and there are three guys standing there that we know from the Granada. Three guys that like they hang out right across the street. And we're like, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, this is our secret surf spot. And I'm like, well, not anymore. <laughs> and um, so it's just really kind of epic adventure that landed us in a place with some people we already knew to hang. And it was just, it ended up being super cool great story but when you're in the middle of it you know you like what's wrong you know nothing's going it's easy to complain and all about that so so as we think about you know your life your days when things don't go the way you think they ought to go and it doesn't and this this stuff is not on my calendar for today kind of a thing as you think about even even the even over a period of weeks and months and years when things when life doesn't turn out the way you want Right? What do we, how do we think about that? You know, knowing the scripture says many times over in a lot of different ways, you know, we make our plans. Or another way of saying it is that the people make plans. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines our steps. The question is, is when your day is not going right or your year is not going the way you think it's going to be, do you really believe that? And so for me, as we get into this, um, one of our key values here is just having an understanding and a trust that what God wants for my life is way more important than what I want for my life. And that's really easy to say. But in, in, even if you think about it in terms of the scope of your life, it might be easy to say, but what about tomorrow when things aren't working out the way? What about in the middle of as things are falling apart, do we really believe that God's plan is more important? So let me talk about that. We're going to be spending some time in Numbers 22. When's the last time you read any scripture from the book of Numbers, right? And you should because it's got some really epic stories. This is one of the best stories, one of the more fun stories, I think, in, in the Old Testament. Um, so I really enjoy this. But it's in Numbers 22. i got to set it up a little bit. Uh, earlier on, Moses had went to Egypt and rescued the people out of Egypt. So we got like maybe an upwards of a million slaves being rescued. And God's going to take them to the promised land. And as they're moving through the wilderness and going from Egypt, going to go to the promised land, there's these epic adventures along the way. And one of those included a guy named Balaam. And if you know the story of Balaam, you know it's a fun story. So let me just show you this real quick. As the people of Israel, like literally, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million people are moving from one place to another. Some of the different kings in the, in the, the lands they were crossing through, they really got worried about invasion. And so there's this guy named Balak who was worried about the people of Israel invading his land. He's like, we got to do something. So Balak, this is Numbers 22, Balak sent some servants to Balaam. Okay, so you got to keep up. Balak is the, um, he's the king of Moab. And um, Balaam is a, is a spiritual guy. Balak, Balak sends some servants to Balaam and says, hey, I need you to come over here and, 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 and talk. we got to talk to you because, and if you do, I will greatly honor you. And, I, and, and whatever you say, I'll do that. But here's the thing. I need you to come and put a curse on those people. Okay, so 
Balak doesn't know what to do. He's worried about invasion, about getting taken over by this horde of people that are coming through the land. He's spiritual mindset to a certain extent. So he's like, you know what? I don't know. We can't defeat them militarily, so we'll do it spiritually. And so we're going to curse these people. And, and he believed that, uh, that Balaam would be able to do that. You know, as, as you think, think about that too, you think about how, you know, you see some things, events unfolding in your life. How often is it that you want to take control and you want to control the outcome of that, right? Whatever it takes, whether it's bargaining with God or promising God, all kinds of things, that's kind of what we do. It's human nature. So Balak says, Balaam, I need you to come and curse these people. What he didn't know was, um, was Balaam was not just a spiritual guy, but he's a prophet of God who wanted to be honorable to the God of heaven. So Balaam says, and he says to the servants of Balak, he said, even if Balak the king were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God and do less or more. So in other words, if he's got a house full, literally tons of gold, I can only say what God wants me to say. And that is like an amazing thing to be even to be able to say that, right? Now what's interesting about it is because of that, what he should have done was that he should have said is, no, I'm not coming because I can only do what God wants me to do. But the guys are like, you know, we could like pay you and it could be a lot. And you're like, this is it. You can, you can make bank here. Like this is, this is your chance. And Balaam decides to go. So God, understanding this, getting it, he sees the beginning, middle, and the end of it. He needed to take a minute to kind of like strengthen the resolve of Balaam. You know, in, in the face of temptation... Like ultimate wealth to be able to do all you got to do is say a couple of words, pretty easy, we'll pay you off. It might be a whole lot of temptation there, right? To kind of do what that king said. So God took a moment to strengthen his little mindset, really, actually. And, and what happens is just an amazing story to me um, as it goes along. So let me show you this. If you know the story, it's just enjoy, it's fun. Uh, here we go, Numbers 22. So as he's going the next day, he's going to go over to Moab and talk to the king. Balaam's donkey saw an angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. The donkey bolted off the road into a field, but Balaam beat the donkey and turned it back onto the road. So it's like all of a sudden his car is breaking down, right, relatively speaking. So it's, you know, it's irritating when that happens, but... The angel of the Lord then after that stood in a place where the road narrowed between the vineyard, two vineyard walls. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it tried to squeeze by and it crushed one of his feet. So Balaam is beating his donkey, right? He's just smacking him. He's irritated. You dumb donkey, what are you doing? And, you know, he just gets mad. So in other words, in his travels, things just aren't working and he's just getting upset. And it just gets worse and worse, right? Then finally, the third time, the angel of the Lord moved further down the road and stood in a place too narrow for the donkey to get by. This time, when the donkey saw the angel, he lay down under Balaam. And in a fit of rage, Balaam beat the animal again and beat him with his staff. So three times, fit of rage. Do you blame him? (laughs) This donkey's running off and then crushing his foot. He's got a broken ankle now or whatever, right? And all of a sudden, now he's he's like, I got to go. And this king is asking and his donkey won't do anything that I want to do, you know, so when life doesn't go your way, what do you do? How do you respond? You know, some people are a little more easier going than others, right? But at some point, you can't take it anymore, and it's, so whether it's, well, you know how it is, whether it's traffic or health or a million other things, sometimes things don't work out the way we want, but as you can surmise in this story here, there's more going on in the story than Balaam understands, that the, the, the donkey's having an experience here, and Balaam's not getting it. And then it gets me thinking, I wonder how many times that happens to us in a, in a variety of ways, where we don't really quite understand all that's going on behind the scenes. So finally, after Balaam, you know, the donkey's laying down, and he's beating the donkey for the third time, the best story, one of the best stories in the whole entire Bible happens next, verse 28. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said, there we go, that's enough, right? So the donkey starts talking. The donkey says, what have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? That's amazing. Crazy, miraculous. And here's the thing, the God of heaven who made all the whole entire universe, he's able to make a donkey talk. I still don't, can't figure out whether or not the donkey's 
doing the talking? Like is the donkey having thoughts or is God using the animal to communicate? So is it God communicating or is the animal actually thinking stuff? I don't know. Crazy story, right? The donkey's like, what are you doing? And, and it's kind of funny. He's like, what have I done to you that you've struck me these things? Well, first of all, you ran off the road. Second of all, you crossed my foot. And third, you're laying down. I can't. I'm like, it's like, like what do you mean? Why, have I, you know, why am I upset? And what I love about it is as the donkey says this, the next thing is, and Balaam's like, well, it's because you've abused me. I wish I, wish I had a sword in my hand right now because I'd kill you. And it's just amazing to me that the scripture doesn't say, Balaam says, you're talking? That's weird, right? It just, the scripture doesn't say that, right? And of course, if you're to imagine the story like, like I do, um, the only, there's one tiny problem with this story, otherwise it would be perfect. But in my mind, it's still in my head that the donkey sounds like Eddie Murphy. <laughs> right? So from Shrek... The donkey is Eddie Murphy's voice, and that's what I'm picturing. The only problem with it is, is that um, the donkey's a female, so it doesn't quite work. And, but I still can't get Eddie Murphy's voice out of my head. So the donkey's like, well, why are you hitting me? And then Balaam's like, well, because you, if I had a sword, I'd kill you right now. So we're, they're having this argument, right? Which is maybe a little subtle lesson in life. You can just count on it. Every time you get into an argument with a donkey, who wins? <laughs> It ain't going to be you, right? Um, and I just wish it, man, there's so many other words for donkey you could use that would just make this even more funny. But um, when, yeah, whenever you get into an argument with a donkey, you're going to lose no matter what. So, and, and things are going to happen. So when things aren't working the way you want them to work, then what? You know, how often is it when things don't go your way, you tend to, first of all, blame other people, or blame God, and sometimes just overreact or react badly, Right? And that's, that's life. It's human nature for sure. But I think it's, I think it's important to, to get really process it to a certain extent and think about how do I normally operate. Because in, in the end, it might speak to your mindset, even your theological mindset about whose life is this? And God has given me life and breath and you know, blood in my body, air in my lungs, and he, he, he gives me a brain to be able to make the decisions that I make, and, and I want to work hard, and I want to be successful, and, and I have, a, I have, I have a, a certain amount of say-so about how my life goes, but in the end, when you're having that terrible day when nothing seems to be going right and nothing's working the way you want, is it a reminder that you're not in control as much as we hate that? You know, we know that control really is an illusion, you know, and at best, the only things we can really control in life is, is our efforts that we put in and our, and our attitude in doing it. God doesn't even control your attitude, right? So, but ultimately, though, as you go through your day, you know, yesterday I had a doctor's appointment and, and I'm running late and all of a sudden traffic. And I'm like, come on. You know, it's just that, you, just in the subtle little things. It's like, wait a second. Whose day is this? Whose life is this? And so often I want it to be mine, and I want to be able to control things. I want to be able to make things work. But even in the little things and in the big things, to what extent can we begin to grow in this understanding that my life is not my own, that the Scripture says that I was bought at it with a price, and that God has a mission and a plan, and it's more important than my plan. It's just not, it's not easy at all. But, of course, we, we see that in this story, and that my life is not just my own. And I think some, some of these lessons can help um, get us to really push through in some of this. So in, the, in this story, I think what's important, maybe just to kind of to round out the story a little bit better, as the story goes on, the, you know, the donkey's talking, and he's like arguing with the donkey about it, which, you know, again, is amazing. And then Balaam gets full awareness about what's going on because then the angel... The angel of the Lord speaks up. That God opens his eyes and Balaam gets a sense that the, the, the angel of God is there. And the angel's like, so why have you struck these donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is reckless before me. We don't have a strong sense in this scripture about what it, he was being reckless about. Other than he was about to be faced with unlimited amounts of temptation to do what this king wanted, to do, wanted done. 
The king wanted him to put a curse on the people of God, and he was willing to bribe them at any cost. So, you know, withstanding that kind of temptation, I got to believe that, that God is saying, hey, listen, you've got to do what I'm telling you to do because not very many people can stay true. And so in, I got to believe that in the moments of this story here that God is saying, listen, we got we to gotta straighten up, we got to tighten it up because you're at risk here. So in other words, I've come here uh, recognizing that your way is reckless. And I, I don't want to believe that any one of us are living in a way that's reckless. We've probably had seasons that that was true. Uh, but, but we can't, how many, how often is it that we live in a way that's careless? You know, just going about doing what we do all the time without second thought about what else is going on, about what God has in store, or, or how may God may be giving me a detour, and I need, to be, I need to be obedient to that and say, God, my day is not my own. I'm going to put in a good effort with a good attitude, but it's yours, right? So if not reckless, but careless even, or maybe you're living in a season of life where maybe you're even being reckless. What does it, get, what does it take for God to get your attention? You know, again, we remember the scripture here in Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend, do not depend on your own understanding. Huge daily struggle for me and probably everybody else. Seek God's will in all that you do and he will make your path straight. The angel of the Lord was using this donkey to make sure Balaam's path was straight. Stay true and stay obedient to what God wants. And so that's, you know, whether it's reckless or careless, that what we got to do is make sure that we get, turn our attention to him because, man, if on my own, my path is never straight. I mess it up too many times. So, God, what do you have in store for me? So as, as, as the angel speaks up and says, I've stood here to kind of get you on, keep you on the right path, the angel of the Lord says to Balaam, go with these guys, but only the word that I speak to you will you speak. And so Balaam went. So in that moment, God like gets his attention, straightens him up, and says, okay, do what I tell you. So then Balaam went, and Balaam went to Balak and said, hey, didn't I tell you, didn't I tell your servants that if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not do anything or say anything against the will of God. And as the story plays out that he stays true to it and refuses to be bribed by this king who is in fear for what might happen. And so in that story, you know, I was thinking, man, how cool is that for me to have a daily mindset that I can't do or go anywhere outside of, my, uh, outside of God's will for me. That God, I'm not going to stray beyond what you want. And, and, and oftentimes my direction, my calendar, my decisions sometimes pull me off the path. But to have that attitude to say, no, God, it's... And that if, if, my, if, if something's happened that's out of sorts, if things aren't going the way that I planned it to, I got to trust that, God, you have a plan. And that whatever happens, is gonna be, it's going to be fine. And that's a difficult thing to live with every day, but that's the challenge. That's what we're called to. There's a whole lot more to this. You know, we talk about mission over me. It's ultimately, it's your life. It's about God. What he wants is way more important for you than what you want. And, I, and of course, we know if, that, that God's plan for you is better than your plans. So we need to learn how to go with that. And then, of course, this bleeds into uh, the mission of the church and that what God has called us to as a church is more important than what those of us who are on the inside want, right? It's about his mission and more. There's a whole lot that goes along with it. But nonetheless, I think it's important for us to, to really sit with this. You know, the mission over me. The mission is, is um, you know, nothing about my life is more important than what God wants for my life. And it, I trust, God, that what you want is better than what I want. So I want to uh, really challenge you in that story. Go back and look at Numbers. It's Numbers uh, 20, chapter 22 through 24. There's a little bit more to that whole story. But it's another amazing story that's good to reflect on and then personalize that. So let me allow you to kind of think through this by asking you a couple of questions. And uh, my questions for today are this, you know, in what ways do your pursuits in life contradict God's assignment for you? And that could be easy. You can look back in your history and think, you know, as I was per per pursuing sin or if I was chasing after something that was unholy, that's a pretty easy to see. But, 
But what about the other things? What about even what's coming in the next week or two? Is there anything that's pulling you away from what God would want? And then secondly, maybe even more importantly, is in what ways can you better tune in to God's direction for your day? You know, sometimes we think about, what, God, what do you want for my life tomorrow, you know, in, in years to come? And I think maybe the, the better question might be, God, what do you want for me today? God, how, do I, how can I best get and sense and hold on to and stay true to the direction you're giving me for today? So I want to let you sit with it for a little bit. We're going to have a time of reflection and then um, to talk about it. Like I said, if you're uh, on one of the campuses, you're here in Ormond, you're with somebody, please feel free to talk through that a little bit, process that. Um, maybe you're in the middle of something right now that's not what you planned, not what you wanted, and you're having to really think through this a little more. Sit with that for a minute. And then, um, and then we'll come back after that reflection time and uh, we'll start to close out our time together. Let's do that. The bad news is your life is not going to go the way you thought. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. But the good news is, as believers, we trust that God has a plan that's better than that. And he promises there's going to be difficulties in it. We know that that's true, but that's why we have community. That's why we have faith, trusting that he will bring us to the outcome that, that he desires. And so in closing, I would just refer back to this. And I hate the fact that I got a misspelled word in there. It's my fault. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do and he will make your path straight. But he's not done. Do not be impressed with your, do not be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part of everything that you produce. And then you, then he will, he will, I look, he will provide. He is the one that we trust for the outcome of blessings. And I know nobody in this room, I don't think, has any barns or vats. But the metaphor there is the blessing uh, comes from him. Don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects for the Lord. Discipline and corrects those who he loves. And, what's, and when I, every time I read that, the whole discipline and correcting thing, I'm thinking like a kid who's getting punished and it's like corporal punishment. But, but maybe I need to be seeing that a little differently in that when I'm heading this direction, he corrects my course. When I get off track, he spins me back around and points me in the right direction. I need that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own wisdom. Instead, trust him, and he will provide that blessing. I want to encourage you in that. There's a whole lot more to this, but as you apply that on a daily basis, it's the greatest time of worship that you can have. God, today is yours. In the rains, in the, in the storms, and in the sun, God, in all the good things and in the difficulties, I trust that you will make things right, make my path straight. 
So I want to encourage you in that and then uh, close in, in prayer and then we'll be done. God, I just um, lean on this. Because I know there are so many struggling with difficulties and struggles and how life has turned each of us around and around so much we get dizzy not knowing which way to go. But you're never surprised by any of it. That even in our mistakes, you straighten us out again. God, you are so good. Your grace and mercy follows us all the days of our lives. So God, we continue to keep our eyes on you. God, help us again to do that one more day. As we pray, as we worship, and as we trust you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being here. You guys have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.